Janice, you were appointed to this position July 2016. Something happened in the UK in June 2016. Um, uh, Brexit, just a month after the Brexit vote. Um, so you've obviously been monitoring this uh, very closely and, uh, I, you know, uh, and your perspective has been, I'm sure, very Canadian, the Canadian lens, uh, looking at uh, all of, uh, you know, all, all, everything that's happened since then. Uh, so why, uh, you know, why do you think um, what is happening here uh, in the UK right now matters to Canadians? Why should Canadians care about uh, the, this Brexit situation? Well, I think that uh, part of that goes to the relationship that Canada and the United Kingdom have and have had for a long time. We are historic partners, allies, and friends. Uh, whether that's because of the people-to-people -people ties. Most, most people you run into here have some link back to Canada. And so uh, that's an interesting topic, uh, an interesting topic for Canadians. Uh, but it's also important to us from a, from a policy perspective and from an economic perspective because, uh, you know, we are probably, of the, of the uh, countries that we look around the world, Canada and the UK are probably among the most like-minded on topics. And so we have a lot of policy uh, interests where we overlap, and we work very closely together on defense and security uh, and, uh, and foreign policy issues. Uh, but economically, Canada uh, looks to the United Kingdom as our largest trading partner in Europe. And so a big driver behind uh, the interest in negotiating the Canada-EU trade agreement, uh, which, uh, which is a huge success already, um, was to make sure that we had preferential access to the UK market. And now the United Kingdom has decided to leave the EU on some terms as yet undetermined, at some time as yet undetermined. <clears throat> there you go. Um, that's the definitive insight, you can quote me on that. Um, and so uh, I think in some ways when I talk to people here in the UK, they're surprised that Canada is interested in what happens with respect to Brexit, what happens with respect to the relationship between the UK and the EU. And obviously, first and foremost, this is about those two political entities sorting out what their future relationship is going to be, the terms of both the, uh, the, the divorce, as I call it, the withdrawal, but as well as the future uh, relationship. Um, but it's really in Canada's interest for all of those reasons to make sure that uh, you know, at the end of this process, there's a strong UK, there's a strong European Union, and there's a strong constructive relationship between them. UK is still one of the largest economies in the world, the EU, a huge market for us. And so the degree to which there's economic disruption, there's any kind of separation, distance, or tension in that relationship will have implications for partners like us and for the economic opportunities that we're so keen to pursue through the Canada-EU trade agreement. So how does somebody like you uh, lay the groundwork for uh, a post-Brexit uh, trade deal with the UK? So I guess there's a few things that we've been pursuing. Uh, first of all, we actually try to you know, make sure that we have as good intelligence as anyone in terms of what's happening here to be able to inform the government uh, back in Canada, and governments back in Canada in terms of what the, uh, what the situation is and what the implications are going to be for Canada. We have tried to um, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So the worst case scenario for Canada, in my view, is if the UK was to leave the EU without a deal. Um, that is the, the situation of kind of maximum uncertainty um, and probably maximum economic dislocation. People disagree about what the size of that is. Uh, so what we've tried to do in that context is make sure that for as much as possible we would have continuity in the business arrangements between Canada and the United Kingdom. So we have negotiated continuity agreements. So civil aviation, for instance, planes will still be able to take off and land between Canada and the United Kingdom. We have an arrangement around nuclear cooperation and the exchange of uranium. So there's kind of those big ticket things, customs arrangements, uh, the exchange of uh, passenger information for civil, secu civil aviation security purposes. Uh, but we've also uh, been working very hard to make sure that there's continuity in the Canada-EU trade agreement. Uh, and so uh, those discussions are, are ongoing. So kind of prepare for the worst. Uh, we've been also trying to work with the business community. And so if you look at the, 
the uh, website for the High Commission here in the UK, we have kind of an evergreen series of products available. So if businesses are wondering, what is this going to mean for me? What are the things I should be thinking about? Uh, where can I go for authoritative information? Come to the Canada House website, and we are, uh, we're trying to provide you access to the best information that we have. But we're also, I think, very much on the lookout for where the opportunities come. And so, uh, you know, we have been working with the United Kingdom probably now for two years um, in thinking about how do we expand our cooperation and collaboration in the fields of science, technology, innovation. And there's some really interesting synergies between Canada and the United Kingdom in that front. You know, their priorities in those areas very much line up with ours, whether it's in the AI world, quantum computing, agriculture, agri-tech, advanced manufacturing. And so the ability for our scientists, for our researchers to work together is really, I think, has huge benefits. So it's about protecting in the short term, but also building a foundation for that relationship in the long term. So you mentioned the, the partnerships. Um, the, the, um, the two countries, I think it was in 2017, signed um, a Canada or announced a Canada-UK action, action plan. plan. That's right. So partnerships in, in uh, clean growth, innovation, uh, gender equality, and all those things. All those things are there actually have from uh, that action plan has there been any action are there actually concrete channels through which these partnerships are being created if somebody is doing, doing AI in yeah. the UK how can they tap into uh, you know uh, any formal channels that they can actually do partnerships with Canada so I'll give you a couple of examples we're seeing where we're seeing already results from this uh, from this action plan. This is an action plan that Prime Minister May and Prime Minister Trudeau agreed to two years ago uh, because we wanted really to think about how do we take this good relationship, which in some ways is you know, good historically, but how do we make it kind of for the modern age, Canada a modern competitive global economy with uh, the UK outside the European Union? How do we make sure that that relationship is as broad and as deep as it can be going forward? So we looked at the usual areas of defense and security. And so, for example, our uh, forces are working together in uh, the UK is in Estonia, Canada is in Latvia. And so uh, in, in terms of a NATO exercise, we're now seeing those things working together in a way that they haven't been. So that's kind of the traditional areas of defense and security. We are Five Eyes security partners. That's that's a foundation that's, uh, that can only uh, bring further benefits to us. But new areas, I mentioned the science, technology, and innovation area. And so uh, we've seen an example already in something called the Power Forward Challenge, where we've actually seen cash put on the table by Canada and the United Kingdom for um, organizations, uh, um, uh, businesses who have ideas about how to actually connect consumers to glee, clean energy in the grid. Um, and so this is not necessarily about you know, bench science. This is really about science which is applicable, which has commercial opportunities. And so uh, we're, down to the two, we're down to the finalists now in that competition. And we're hoping to be in a position to announce very soon winners of that. And so that's a very concrete outcome that we wouldn't necessarily have otherwise had. Um, our governments are working together to try to share knowledge and experience on digital government. Um, both of us, both governments are under pressure from our citizens to uh, get out of the Stone Ages and actually be able to catch up to Estonia in terms of e-government and uh, actually being able to catch up with the banks in terms of how you are interacting. You guys are making it really hard for governments. Uh, you know, you, your ability to download apps and all those things that David talked about and interact with your consumers, citizens expect that of government. And so we're really trying to learn from each other on, on how we do that. So I think there's a range of opportunities. Um, and uh, I think the question is just how do, we, how do we make sure that we make people aware of them uh, and so that you have opportunities, uh, you can work uh, with us to pursue them. Probably one of the greatest assets, I know I'm answering long oh, answers, no, I apologize. Um, one of the greatest assets that uh, I have really come to know and, uh, and appreciate in high commissions around the world and, can, and the one here in the UK is, uh, and embassies around the world is, uh, is the Trade Commissioner Service. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the Trade Commissioner Service, but we have folks right in every embassy and high commission uh, around the globe uh, and consulates, and they're there to basically work with you as clients to try and help you to pursue your business objectives in that country. And so I think I see George House here from our Trade Commissioner Service. George, put your hand up in the air. Thank you very much. Um, and so we work with you very much as clients and try to help you uh, pursue those business opportunities. Um, and similarly, they work on investment 
investment attraction back to Canada. And so if you want to learn more about this and what is it going to mean for your business sector, where are the opportunities, fintech, AI, whatever it is, um, there are people like George who are sector specialists and regional specialists who are there as resources and I really urge you to, uh, to work with them. You mentioned that uh, the UK is Canada's uh, fifth largest uh, export market, uh, but the truth is that the numbers are pretty small. Like once you get past maybe the third or fourth largest export market for Canada, it kind of uh, tails off uh, uh, considerably afterward. I think the UK uh, represents or takes in about 3% of Canadian exports. So it's, and most of that is gold shipments. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, the, the numbers aren't, aren't very large. Uh, Canada uh, does a little bit better on the services side and obviously there's a lot of investment and capital flowing between two countries. But the question is this, is it possible that the economic ties between Canada and the UK actually deepen after Brexit, as a result of Brexit? Well, uh, two comments, I guess. First of all, um, you're, you put your finger exactly on something that I say to business audiences both in Canada and the, and the United Kingdom. We do, the, the balance of trade is about $40 billion Canadian. So we do that in 20 days between Canada and the United States. We can do better in the United Kingdom. You know, we have the same legal relation, the same legal foundations. We have the same, uh, the same government foundations. So there's no reason why this should be a very, um, uh, a very simple market for Canadian exporters who are interested in, uh, in exploring uh, international opportunities. So we can do better. So uh, how do we actually do that? And is Brexit going to be a, a factor in that? There's no question, I think, that right now what we're seeing in the UK market is um, there's a lot of uh, money sitting, waiting to see exactly what the long-term uh, future of the, uh, of the UK is going to be with respect to Brexit. But I think that as the UK does leave the European Union, and I am convinced it will leave the European Union, um, they will be looking at their, themselves in the world in a very different way. If we think about it, 40 years they've been in the year 42 now, I guess. 40, they've been in the European Union. And all of, that, all of that time and attention and focus will now be redistributed to how they're going to interact with the rest of the world. And I think Canada is very well positioned to be, able to, uh, to be able to access those opportunities. And you're right to say right now, uh, a lot of our merchandise exports are, uh, are in, the, uh, in the gold world. And so it does, it does uh, change the numbers a little bit. We can do a lot better. There are uh, a lot of UK consumers who would be very interested and businesses would be interested in, uh, in accessing Canadian products and services. And so I think we've got to make sure that they know what's available and be, and be uh, uh, ambitious and aggressive in this market. One area, for instance, that I think we have a tremendous opportunity is thinking about international education as a business. There is no reason why Canada's first class universities and colleges couldn't be attracting students from the United Kingdom to come and study in Canada. Fantastic opportunity. But the same thing with some of our manufacturers as well, whether it's in the aerospace world, uh, in the agricultural world, there's just, I think there's tremendous opportunities. We just got to be in the market. Yeah, I think there, I've got a prepared a couple of charts, yeah. Um, and what you, you a surprise, do, yeah. Theo, you have some uh, charts. So, uh, so actually, I, I don't know how well you can see the numbers there, but you do see like uh, a pickup in Canadian investment in the UK since, uh, since the Brexit vote. Uh, so uh, there's definitely a lot of interest. Uh, there's, an, uh, I don't know, if, and then yes, and that chart shows investment, the UK investment in Canada, which is showing the opposite thing. So we're not actually, lots of Canadians are still investing in Canada. You're not getting a lot of UK investment in mm. Canada. How can Canada attract more investment from, from uh, UK business? What can Canada do? Uh, to attract more investment. Well, I think uh, let's look at the, the why, why would you invest in Canada? Uh, I think we have, you know, what do investors look for? They look for stability and predictability, and I think the Canadian market very much offers that. Our fiscal fundamentals are strong. We have the lowest net debt in the G7. Our economic fundamentals are strong. We have the lowest unemployment rate in 40 years, second highest growth rate in the G7. Uh, we have a highly skilled and talented workforce in Canada. Uh, it's a safe, secure place to do business, which I think matters a lot in this world. Uh, we have very uh, uh, competitive tax environment. We have, uh, I think, a very um, uh, generous uh, research and development incentives. And so I think 
the picture is, uh, is a very strong one. We have, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, really good reasons why businesses should be looking strongly at Canada. And so I think the challenge for us is to make sure that we're offering, we're, we're really marketing that opportunity strongly. Um, and we uh, are showing and showcasing to investors around the world that, uh, that these opportunities really exist right across Canada in so many different areas, in the goods and the services area. I wonder if you can sort of outline the trade strategies of the current government. Right. Because I was here in, uh, actually, I think it was 2006, June 2006, where uh, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper gave a speech in London and to announce that Canada was an energy superpower. Uh, you know, times have changed. Um, obviously, uh, the current government has a different strategy. It talks more about trade inclu inclusion or more inclusive trade, I should say. Um, SMEs, e-commerce, there's a different focus. I mean, can you give the audience maybe an idea of kind of what the emphasis is in terms of trade promotion, that the type of trade that Canadian government wants to do uh, with, with you know, global business and what that means for the opportunities for UK business? Yeah, I'm not sure I would say that, uh, that the strategy has changed. I think it's evolved. There's no question about that. And so, I mean, one of the reasons to invest in Canada is the Canadian, through the Canadian market, you have access to, uh, through free trade agreements that we've negotiated with countries around the world, 65% per glo of global markets uh, and consumers in those markets are now accessible through preferential trade agreements with Canada. Canada is the only G7 country that has a trade agreement with every other G7 country. And so if you think about Canada as a base, you have access to the Asia Pacific through the CPTPP, through the Canada-US-Mexico uh, agreement, you're right through North America, and now through the EU. So that's a phenomenal platform. And I think that when we think about the inclusive trade strategy that you mentioned, part of it is you heard the government talking a lot about trade diversification. You know, we know as Canadians that so much of our prosperity and our economic future depends on deepening and strengthening our trade relationships around the world. We have done tremendous business with the United States and with Mexico, as you said. We need, we need to expand that. We need to actually help our exporters to actually pursue those other markets that are now available through these trade agreements. We also have to get more businesses in Canada interested in export. So when you think uh, about the inclusive trade agenda, and as you mentioned, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, enterprises headed by women, uh, indigenous enterprises, too many of those businesses have not actually seen their, uh, seen their business opportunities in export markets. How do we support them to do that? So diversification in our markets, diversification in terms of the range of exporters, making sure that those trade agreements that we're negotiating cover not just the traditional kind of um, goods trade and reducing tariffs, Tariffs, but how do we get at the services trade and, and dealing with those, uh, with those uh, uh, regulatory barriers, those pernicious barriers that make it tough to do businesses on the service side, including restrictions on the mobility of people. And we know in Canada that we've really, I think, led the world on uh, a positive and inclusive approach to immigration, which is, I think, a huge asset. If you're thinking about doing business in Canada, you want to be able to attract a global workforce, our immigration policies are a huge asset to you. And finally, it's about making sure that we support businesses that want to be in the export business. It's no good negotiating these trade agreements if we then put them on a beautiful shelf somewhere in Ottawa and we say, look at that trade agreement. Isn't it so beautiful? It's not, you know what, that's useless. What we have to do is make sure that businesses understand the nature of those opportunities. They understand how they can access those markets and we can actually put those two things together. And just quickly, um, because we had the uh, the pipeline announcement earlier yes, yeah. uh, this week, and if, if you know if you're uh, a foreign business wanting to make a major investment in Canada, and you see the challenges that Canada has in getting some of these larger <coughs> kind of um, infrastructure projects done, um, you know the the consultations that are required to get these things done. I mean, what type of uh, advice would you give UK businesses uh, or any foreign business, and you know when they're looking at that? And, <coughs> thinking, should I move ahead with, seriously, with an investment in Canada? I think that, uh, so we had the announcement the, that the government has approved the go-ahead of the TMX pipeline, uh, which is uh, an announcement I know a lot of people have been waiting for. I think it, uh, it obviously, it uh, was a, uh, an announcement that took a lot of work to get to this point. There was a, a decision that, uh, by the courts, that there hadn't been enough consultation and engagement with our indigenous peoples. This is going to go through indigenous lands, and so there had to be a, 
uh, an, an additional process. And the government has looked at the results of those consultations and engagements, and they've decided to proceed with the, with the, uh, with the approval with some particularly interesting conditions, mm -hmm. including all of the corporate tax revenues that are going to be generated by this project will be invested into clean energy projects to try and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and enhance our ability to think about how do we benefit from the transition to a low carbon economy. But I think that project, uh, obviously, uh, given the, uh, the, the complexity of not just the, uh, the, uh, uh, the traditional approvals of a, of a pipeline, which I have to look at environmental considerations and economic considerations, but the fact that they were going through indigenous, uh, indigenous territories, uh, it took a little bit longer than I think that, uh, than, uh, that certainly the proponents would have liked. But I think what you can count on in Canada is you have a very highly skilled uh, regulatory um, uh, regulatory uh, uh, set of bodies, uh, very competent public authorities who are uh, who are uh, very uh, very professional and uh, uh, very interested in working with uh, with business community in a way that that does enhance the. Uh, the approach to uh, to doing business there. We have timelines around our regulatory approvals to try and deal with that issue of certainty. Um, and uh, I think that uh, government is very interested in supporting uh, these major capital projects. Uh, we have an Invest in Canada authority who's willing to work with businesses who want to come and invest in Canada to clear barriers to, to coming into our marketplace. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, all of those things taken together uh, should provide a level of, uh, a level of uh, predictability and stability which investors, I think, are looking for. Um, well, thank you very much, High My Commissioner. Pleasure. My Thanks pleasure. Thank here. you for doing this, and uh, enjoy your day, everybody. <laughs>